Kate Rayworth, Senior Associate at Oxford University's Environmental Change Institute and author of Donut Economics. I could not resist that. Forgive me. Sometimes you have to break the rules to make new rules. Okay, who here has ever studied economics? Hands up. Oh, we are in the house. I'm here too because I studied economics and it made me mad. And if you've never studied economics, don't worry, it's already been imbibed into your brain and body and life, but I'm going to give you a crash course in 20th century economics in one slide. This is what we were taught. The first diagram, supply and demand. Welcome to economics, the art of household management. It's all about the market. And then price is suddenly the metric of concern in which we must measure everything and anything that falls outside price is called an externality and that includes the death of the living world. Who are we? Rational economic man. I drew his picture. Yes, it would have to be a man standing alone, no dependents. He's got money in his hand. He's got ego in his heart. He's got a calculator in his head. He's got nature at his feet. He hates work, he loves luxuries, and he knows the price of everything. And the more that we teach our students that this is who we are, this is who they become. We become the models that we make of ourselves. And the goal? Well, of course, it's endless economic growth. No matter how rich a nation already is, like yours and mine and yours and theirs, no matter how rich it is, our politicians and economists think the solutions to all our problems lie in yet more growth endlessly. It's an insanity. And it's led us into crises. We need a new vision of who we want to be. And that's why I drew the only donut that actually turns out to be good for us. So good for you, you don't need to eat it because it's all in your head. Imagine this as a compass for human prosperity in the 21st century. And imagine humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the center of that picture. So the hole in the middle of the donut is a place where the people are falling short on the essentials of life. It's where people do not meet their needs for food and water and healthcare and education and housing and income and equity. I can say this with confidence that Every government in the world has agreed to this because these are the social priorities and the sustainable development goals. Leave no one in the hole, but at the same time, don't overshoot the planetary boundaries. The nine life-supporting systems that keep humanity in the living, delicate balance of this only known living planet in the universe. So meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. It's that easy. <laughs> and yet it's not that easy, because if that's our goal, and it's no longer endless growth, it's thriving in balance, just like a heartbeat. If thriving is our goal, well, we are so far out of balance. As all of the red in this image shows, billions of people worldwide falling short in the essentials of life, and we are overshooting at least six of the nine planetary boundaries. So this, this is our selfie. We, the generation, awake, alive, and responsible, empowered, financed, at this time, September 2023, this is our collective selfie of humanity and the rest of the living world. And I think our children and their children will pull this picture from the archive and they will ask us, what did you do once that you knew? There's no going back from seeing this. We read its headlines in the news every day. Can we keep ourselves awake to the next hurricane, the other flood, another volcano? Where was it this time? Can we keep ourselves literally alert to the breaking down of that which sustains us? Can we recognize that the impacts fall and have been falling? If we're talking of metacrisis or polycrisis here, it's been around the world for decades. 
The undermining of the life support systems undermines the lives of every one of us. The most shocking statistic here to me, the one that I actually can't get my head around, is that the richest 1% of the people in the world own half the world's wealth. The extremes of inequality of the system that we've created. So where do we go from here? I'm showing you a global picture, right? But we want to bring it closer to home. So let's come down to national donuts. Here's just four nations. Malawi, where people live on around $1,500 per person per year. Massive human shortfall in the middle, not overshooting their share of any ecological boundaries. China, double whammy. Human shortfall, ecological overshoot. Sweden, on around, around $61,000 per person per year. Almost completely blue in the center. Yes, you have challenges here, but compared to the rest of the world, you are provisioning for the very fundamentals of people's needs. But oh, you have this ecological overshoot. And then the US, inequality and overshoot too. Not one of these countries can be claiming to be there. There's one country in the world that's closer than any other to getting into the donut. Anyone want to shout out the one you think it is? Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Nearly meeting people's needs, almost within the means of the living planet. Now they haven't actually even been trying to do exactly that. What if they actually aimed for that? What if every country aimed for that? So let me put this in a scatter plot, right? The place where every country wants to be is the top left-hand corner, the donut. That's because we meet the needs of all people and we do it within the means of the living planet. So number one, there is not a single country there. Costa Rica is closest. Sweden, you're up there, sitting next to Norway, okay? Hi, Australians. Hi, Australians. Yeah, you're out there with Canada and the US. I want to dance with this camera. <laughs> so, number one, whenever you hear anybody talking about developed nations, you will ask them, where exactly do you mean? Because I can't see any. Right? There's no developed countries here. There is absolutely nothing developed or advanced about overshooting planetary boundaries. You're just destroying the life support systems of the planet and for everybody else. Second, yes, these countries are drawn like separate scatter plots, and yet we know from everything Nate and Olivia have said, they are deeply interconnected. Through histories of colonialism, through military power, corporate power, through trade and finance rules, through resource extraction that Olivia showed us in painful detail, through the current and future impacts of climate breakdown. So we need transformation within and between every nation. Now here's the rub. This is what economic growth has done. This has been the trajectory. As a country gets richer first, that first increase in income gives you increase in access to energy, as Nate told us. Huge improvements in human well-being, but instead of heading into the donut, we just go straight past it, into consumption and overshoot. That's the story we've created from the systems we've made and invented. Can we turn this around? Can we be the generation that actually starts to turn this around? What would the future of prosperity look like? What if low-income countries become the rise nations? India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Malawi, Tanzania, Kenya, that they rise and they meet everybody's needs without overshooting planetary boundaries like all countries before them have done. How the heck will they do that? Because it's never been done before. Middle-income countries, Russia, Mexico, Iran, Turkey, China, to meet people's needs for the first time, already coming back within planetary boundaries. It's never been done before. And high-income countries, yours, mine, every rich country in the world, Europe, Australia, Canada, the US, Japan, New Zealand, to massively reduce all of that red overshoot that is screaming out at us in energy, in material consumption. How do we reduce while meeting everybody's needs for the first time? Because by hell, we can do it. We have the income to do that. And to massively rebalance between nations. 
rebalance with reparations, with redistribution, with redesigning governance and whose voice is actually heard. To me, this, if there is a future that takes us away from a mutually assured destruction, it's a future that takes us to this mutually assured thriving. We don't get there alone. No country can get into the donut alone and be okay. This is a mutually interdependent project. How could we even begin to possibly get there? I think we need to deeply change the dynamics that we're pursuing in the world, and it's not going to come from endless growth. We need to be regenerative and distributive by design. And let me tell you what I mean. We've inherited linear degenerative economic systems. We take Earth's materials. We make them into stuff we want, use it for a while, and then we throw it away. And that take, make, use, lose, that is what pushes us over planetary boundaries. That is what runs down the living world. We need to bend those arrows around so that resources aren't used up. There is no up. There is no away. There is no waste. They must be used again and again. Allow nature to regenerate, that is her genius, that's what life is. And we must mimic that with our materials we've made so that we refurbish and repair and replace and reuse and we share and only ultimately recycle. I'm not talking about going from degenerative to sustainable, just about sustaining where we are. We have so degraded and destroyed, we must regenerate and bring back. I'm not talking about just being 100% recyclable and then we just spin everything round and round. If we herd Nate, that will just take more energy. We need to repair upstream. We need to reduce demand. So some companies in the world are starting, just starting towards this future taking a step towards regenerative design of their products. Fairphone, they make a phone that's modular by design so you can open it up and replace just the piece that needs replacing so that you massively reduce your draw on those lithium mines that Olivia just showed us. Houdini, born in Stockholm, who only make clothes either from wool and tensile organic fibers or from recycled cotton, recycled polyester and nylon. They separate them. They share their pattern. They share their technology. They want to create an ecosystem of circular material use. Interface Carpets, who, um, whose ambition is for their factory to be as generous as the wild land next door, to sequester as much carbon and store as much groundwater and cool the air and harvest as much energy as the forest nearby. Sanergy Toilets in Kenya, who collect the human waste and turn it back into nutrient and put it back on the field. They create jobs, they create health and privacy and respect. These companies are taking a step towards regenerative design. So from degenerative to regenerative, but also we've inherited economies that are deeply divisive. They capture opportunity and value in the hands of a 1% globally and locally through regulation, through tax code, through inheritance, through privilege. There is absolutely no chance of humanity living in the donut in such an unequal world. We need to create economies that are distributive by design, sharing value and opportunity far more equitably with all who co-create it. Now, I'm not talking about going from, let's say, divisive, like everybody in their own private car, to inclusive, a bus in the traffic jam. I don't want to be on a bus in the traffic jam. I want a distributive system where the bus actually travels faster and cheaper, more effectively than everybody else in their car. So let's not just include people in a broken system. Let's create a distributive system. Let's not just say we're going to go from paying poverty wages to living wages. Congratulations, you can now actually live off your wage. What about living wage plus a profit share, plus a voice, plus an ownership of this company? And there are companies that are taking a step towards this distributive design. Creative Handicrafts in Mumbai, where the owners of the factory are the workers in the factory. Richer Sounds, an employee-owned company in the UK. Fair b, &B not Airbnb, but stick an F in front. Fair b, b one landlord, one property. And some of the money from that payment goes into community projects so everybody benefits. And Lush have committed to 
paying a fair tax. What is that? It means paying the right amount of tax in the right place at the right time. We know a lot of companies spend a lot of money making sure they pay the least amount of tax in as few places as possible, as rarely as possible. Lush say we belong to society, we depend upon society for our own thriving, we will give back. So here are some beginnings of designs, companies that are just starting to do this. But off the stage, away from the press release and the headlines, when you talk to executives, they'll admit a more difficult story. From a major tea company, they said, look, we'd love to, play, to pay the tea pickers a higher wage, a living wage, but it can't, can't come from us. I mean, the market just won't bear that. So they're going to have to get that through raising their own productivity. We talked to a major consumer beauty uh, cosmetics company who said, we would love to package our shampoos in refillable bottles, but just the upfront investment of that, the capex on that just isn't going to give us the return. We can't do it. I met somebody at a circular economy summit who had been invited onto the stage to talk about sustainable clothing that they were in, leading in their major clothing company. Off the stage, she said to me, I've been asked to come up with a regenerative line of clothing and I'm told I have to deliver 15% margins from the get-go. It's impossible. So there's a real schism between what we know could be possible, regenerative design, distributive design, and what is actually feasible within the companies that we've created. And when you talk to folks like this, and maybe you can feel it in yourself, a kind of <coughs> something is really stuck. So here's what we think at Donut Economics Action Lab is the challenge, right? We've inherited this world in which business as usual, which is designed to maximize margins and dividends, it is sitting in a space of degenerative design and divisive design because that is what will enable you to extract the most. And only a tiny bit of it, oh, only just this little slither, can occasionally manage to be regenerative, occasionally manage to be distributive. We celebrate that slither. We put it on the front of our website and we put that behind the scenes. This is our sustainable investment. This is our sustainable product line. But the most business is still over there. How can we redesign business? so that it just lives in this space of regenerative and distributive design. We need to unlock those possibilities. So whenever I talk to companies and they come to us, oh, we like the donut, that would be a nice brand on our website. Whenever they come to us, I say, I don't want to talk about the design of your products. That's a nice phone, a nice shirt, that's great food. I don't want to talk about the design of your products. I want to talk about the design of your company. And I'm going a little bit back to Eric, right? The inner development goals. I call it corporate psychotherapy. Sometimes companies say, oh, we work with such complex supply chains and the factory managers, oh, the factory managers, we can't trust them. Psychotherapists will say, you need to do some inner work. Oh, it's not them, it's me. So let's look inside the company because we need to design companies and I invite you whether you are here with a company and a startup or a really established big company, or you're here as an investor thinking about companies, but even if you are here as an investor, you are a company. We all work for an organization. So I invite you just to hold your organization as I take you through the deep design and ask yourselves, what is our deep design drawing us towards right now? And what needs to change if we are going to belong in business in the future on this planet? Do you notice that some companies are just driven by this question? How much value can we extract through this enterprise? I mean, they never actually say it out loud because that's not polite, but that's what's guiding the company. How much value can we extract? And then other people in business you meet, there's just some light dancing in their eyes. How many benefits can we generate through this enterprise? I mean, what else could we do? Yeah, yeah, but what else could we do? We could do that. How can we make that possible? Why is the world so split into these two very different kinds of companies? We think it's the deep design of the company itself. Five traits, your purpose, your networks, your governance, your ownership, and your finance. So let's think about purpose. 
Why does your company exist? I mean, what is it in service of in the world? If you have a chocolate company, you may say, well, we want to be the biggest chocolate company in Europe. Hoorah. Tony's Chocoloni was founded in Amsterdam with the goal of creating 100% slave-free chocolate as the norm. Notice that their purpose doesn't mention them. Their purpose is about something much bigger in the world in which they are in service towards 100% slave-free chocolate as the norm. And they even created a mission lock on that to make sure that that wonderful brand doesn't get just turned into a nice to have, but let's take away the values. So what is your purpose? And can it be repurposed? What about your networks, your relationships with your employees, with your customers, with your suppliers, with everybody in your industry? Do you see them as your competitors or as your allies? How do you hold your purpose and intent and your values through those relationships? A lot of them can be very extractive commodity chains, squashing the returns for the suppliers to increase the returns for me. El Puente, a company in Germany who buy food and crafts from suppliers around the world, they really showed that they had serious commitment to their networks. When COVID struck, you know what so many companies did. They pulled back, they cut the chains, cut the contracts, retreat. El Puente did the opposite. They reached out. We are here for you. This is exactly why our relationship exists. We are here for you. We will pay you up front if that's what you need and you deliver when you can because we are in solidarity with you. That's what our business is. It's a relationship. How can we make that kind of relation the norm of 21st century business. What about how a company is governed? Who's in the room? And what metrics are we deciding by, right? Who is on the board? Have you noticed that finance always has its seat reserved? In fact, it's got the whole damn lot. Many companies just are so still governed, whether it's shareholders or equity or venture capital, it's, oh, what will the funders say? What will the finance, oh, they're coming, the finance is coming, as if finance just holds everything and yet it's the money coming into something, but the company has impact in the world. Faith in Nature, a shampoo company, they said, we always used to ask, well, what would nature do? And they said, we keep asking this, damn it, let's just put nature on the board. So have you seen this tree? There's actually a tree here with us in the room. This tree is one of 11 directors on their board. Nature is on the board represented by an environmental lawyer who tells them as an equal director, this is what nature wants us to do. And if you can read, it says, we're the first company in the world to give nature a voice, but we don't want to be the last. They're inviting every single one of you to join them. What if every company in this room, every investment house in this room, put nature on the board and nature asks, what do you want me to do? How would that change who you are? And whether you are regenerative and distributive or caught in divisive and extractive? How is your company owned? Is it owned by shareholders, by venture capital, by private equity? Is it owned by its employees or by its customers? Is it owned by the state? Because all of these ownership designs, of course, have huge implications for who's represented there, whose values are there, the purpose. As we all know, Patagonia changed their ownership model and they divided the voting rights from the dividend rights to protect and lock in their purpose and to channel the stream of returns to social environmental investment, because that's what they want to make happen in the world. Business as a vehicle for transformation. And lastly, finance. And it sits at the bottom, because as a psychotherapist, a psychotherapist would tell you, what lies deepest is most powerful, right? So where is the finance of, in your business coming from? Or if you are an impact investor, actually, what are you bringing? What is that finance expecting? What is it extracting? What is it demanding? And is it aligned with the purpose of this company or is it fundamentally in tension with it? And what's going to win? What's going to win between purpose and finance all depends on how this company is owned and governed. Is finance going to extract the fast returns? Purpose just becomes a strapline on the website? Or actually, 
And I'm gonna to speak to the startups in the room. If you're starting up a company that you believe can help bring humanity back in planetary boundaries and meet the needs of all, don't just design your product, design your company to protect yourself from excessively powerful finance. Design yourself so that you can stay true to your purpose even as you scale. And lastly, if you're here with the government or policy thinking, think, well, no one company can do this alone. No, they can't. We need policies. We need every nation and Europe and the world to be surrounded by a set of policies that actually make this kind of business the norm, that recognizes it exists and gives it legal form, that procures from companies that do this, that enables them through taxation, that helps companies transform to becoming employee-owned, to becoming stakeholder-owned, to becoming steward-owned companies, and helps the new ones arise. At Donut Economics Action Lab, we love working with cities that say we have an incubator hub. We want to bring our city into the donut. We are going to work with our companies we're incubating to make sure they design not just their products, but themselves, so that they will have a long journey to becoming this kind of company. If this sounds of interest, we have created a tool that's in the Commons, and we invite you to look at Donut Design for Business, and you could do this in your own company, and think about your purpose, your networks, your governance, your ownership, and your finance. And if you're here as an investor, I just ask you, what kind of transformation do you want to be part of in the world? How are you going to turn that money back into energy? into action in a company? What com kind of companies do you want to seed? And which kind do you want to help let go of? So let me come back to where we began. Markets first, rational economic man, and endless growth do not serve us. It's still being taught in far too many universities around the world. And to me, that's a travesty. And I teach many of the students who are taught this and they know, they know that they are enrolled in a degree that is not serving our times and is not equipping them to be the business leaders, to be the politicians, to be the journalists, the lawyers, the community activists, the protesters of the future. They are protesting against that mindset, does not serve us. We need a mindset that starts by saying, what is our purpose? And the donut offers us one to meet the needs of all within the means of the living planet. Can we enable countries to rise, to reorient and to reduce? Can we bring about a rebalancing with all the complexity that Nate and Olivia have shared to move towards a place of thriving? That's gonna take regenerative design, not just sustainable, but regenerative design. Not just inclusive, but distributive enterprise. These can absolutely exist, but only if we design companies to bring it about, to have the purpose, the networks, the governance, the ownership, and the finance to make that possible. The beauty of it is that economies and companies are entirely a human construct. We invented them, and we can reinvent them. And let me leave you with Eric's point. You can always ask yourself, in every business conversation, the next step and the next investment that I take, am I just seeking a place of familiar 20th century comfort? Or is it actually leading me and us towards the person and the business and the economy and the future that we have the possibility to be? Thank you. <laughs>